Glory to God. God bless you. God bless you. Glory to God. I'm going to get started. How to overcome stress, part six. Uh, today's subtopic is three pillars of faith for overcoming stress. Uh, let's go to Hebrews 10, 12, 13. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Amen. After Jesus had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Uh, we know that Jesus came, he died for our sin, and he ascended on high. The Bible makes us understand that he sat at his sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemy to be made his full stool. Uh, Acts 3 19 tells us that he will be he goes to heaven and the heaven will receive him until the restoration of all things. Of to the restoration of all things. Uh, uh, and uh, sitting on the right hand on the Father doesn't mean Jesus is just sitting doing nothing. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So that tells us that Jesus is active. Jesus is interceding for us. Hallelujah. Jesus is our intercessor. Let's go to Romans 8.34. A Romans 8 34 is a who is he who condemns it is Christ who died and furthermore is also reason who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us Jesus sit, sat at the right hand sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us glory to god glory to god now i'm going to go over there three pillars when i say pillars pillars supports that supports our faith three pillars that support or three pillars that sustain our faith and number one applying the finished work of the cross uh, we went over that last week. We went over that last week. And I'm going to go over that again this week. Then we move to number two. And we conclude at number three. So number one, you know, pillar. Uh, this really helped me myself in my prayer, in my intercession, praying for others, doing special prayer for others. I always look back to the cross. Uh, look back to the cross, not only looking back to the cross, but we have to apply. We have to apply the finished work on the cross. Jesus finished the work on the cross. Whatever you are trusting God for, it has already been done on the cross. All we need to do is to apply. So number one pillar, this is a very powerful pillar to know that Jesus has, 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 has uh, 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 finished the work on the cross. Pillars, uh, those pillars support your faith, increase your faith, knowing uh, and sustain your faith, knowing that Jesus has finished everything on the cross. So the first one is, as I said, applying. We have to learn how to apply the finished work on the cross. Applying the finished work on the cross, as described earlier, Jesus went to the cross voluntarily. There he gave his life because he knew that his main purpose on earth was to rescue humanity from bondage, from the devil, and lead us back to the Father. To lead us back to the Father, he died on the cross to pay for all sin. Jesus has already paid for every sin imaginable. All we need to do is to repent because that's why Jesus came so that our sin will be forgiven. 
Amen. So our sin will be on him so we can go to the Father, ask for forgiveness of sin, and then be restored back to the Father. So Jesus paid for all sin. Jesus paid for all diseases. Jesus paid for infirmity. Jesus paid for anything that you can imagine on the face of this earth. Sickness, disease, poverty. Jesus has already pay for it. What we need to do is to apply, hallelujah, apply the finished work on the cross. It is finished. If you don't apply it, you will receive the benefit of the cross. We got to apply it. He paid the price for our sins. He paid the price for disease diseases, he paid, paid the price for infirmity, he paid the price for lack, so we got to apply it. Amen? Let's go to Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. In other words, he paid the price for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. He paid the price for our iniquity. He was charged us for our peace. He was charged us for our peace was upon him. And by his strife we are healed. Jesus had already paid the price for transgressions, glory to God, for iniquity, for he paid the price for our peace. Hallelujah. If you don't have peace today, all you need to do is to apply the finish work of the cross because Jesus has already paid the price for your peace and as I said the other day the rest and peace is deterrence to stress amen deterrent to stress rest and peace is deterrent to stress amen so Jesus has paid the price for our peace he has paid the price for our sicknesses, he has paid the price for our diseases. He paid the ransom price to free us from all physical, emotional, mental, spiritual issues. He delivered us from anxiety, he delivered us from fear, he delivered us from depression, he delivered us from stress and every other yoke of the enemy. Glory to God. Every other yoke of the enemy, Jesus has already delivered us. So what we need to do is to go back on the cross and apply the finished work of the cross. Hallelujah. By his strife, we are healed. Glory to God. Even iniquity. He paid the price for our iniquity. He paid the price for depression. He paid the price for anxiety. He paid the price for fear. Hallelujah. To the land of God. So what we need to do is to apply it. It's already done on the cross. Amen. In John 19, 30, the Bible says it is finished. Hallelujah. It is finished. He has already paid the price. John 19, 30. It is finished. Amen. What is the Greek word for finish? Mean finish. It is done. It paid the price for, for all our sicknesses, all for infirmity. For fear, for depression, for stress, for oppression, for possession, for suppression, name it. Jesus has already paid the price. So we have to apply the finished work on the cross. And that is number one pillar. It is a powerful pillar for me and you to know that Jesus has already paid the price. It elevates my faith. Glory to God. He helped me to push forward. Hallelujah. As I apply the finished work on the cross. It is finished. What does that mean? It means it is completely paid for. It is completely paid for. You don't need to pay for it again. Amen. So rest comes to us when we understand and have total confidence in the finished work of the cross. How does rest come? 
Rest comes to us when we understand what Jesus has done on the cross. And we have total confidence in the finished work on the cross. This will help me in my ministry, having a power ministry. It helped me to know that the work is finished. All I'm doing, I'm just applying the finished work on the cross. I'm just applying what Christ has already done, what he has completely paid for. So when we know and we understand, we will have a, what, a total confidence in the finished work on the cross. Peace will come to us. Once you believe in what God has said and done on your behalf, you can rest knowing that he is faithful to keep his promise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that's a pillar. When you know, it is a pillar. When you know what God has done on your behalf. When you understand the finished work on the cross. You will rest assured. Hallelujah. Amen. You will, you will be peaceful. Glory to God. Knowing that he is faithful. Come on. How many know that God is faithful? Our God is faithful to keep his promises. To all his promises, he is faithful to keep it. Glory to God. So we can rest assured. This gives me peace that God has paid the price for everything that I'm going through right now, that I will go through right now. All I have to do is to apply the finished work on the cross. Glory to God. Hebrews 11.11. 11. Let's go to Hebrews 11.11. 11. Glory to God. Hebrews 11.11. 11. The Bible says, By faith, Sarah herself also received strength. By faith, received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age. Because she judged him faithful who had promise. She judged him faithful who had promised. God is faithful. Glory to God. Whatever God said he will do, he will do it. What God will always keep all his promises. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God says he's going to protect us. Trust me, he's going to protect you. It's less for you to believe. It is less for us to believe the finished work on the cross apply the finished work on the cross and receive the benefit of the finished work on the cross. Transgressions, Jesus paid for it. Iniquity, Jesus paid for you. For your healing, Jesus paid for it. For prosperity, Jesus paid for it. For anxiety, Jesus paid for it. For, for fear, Jesus paid for it. For stress, he paid for it. We don't need to go through this anymore. All we need to do, look backward and remember what Jesus has already done on the cross. Believe it, this gives us confidence. Hallelujah. That's why I call it pillar. Pillars of faith. It is a pillar of faith. It elevates my faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It elevates my faith to believe and to have confidence that what Christ has paid for it, God is going to do it for me. Because God is faithful. God is faithful. So you can have absolute confidence. That as you trust in the finished work of the cross, God will act in your best interest. Glory to God. Glory to God. So that's what happened. Because when you remember what Christ has done on the cross, the number one pillar of faith, applying the finished work on the cross, you can have absolute confidence. That as you trust in the finished work of the cross, God will act in your best interest. However, we must remember that spiritual rest does not mean abandoning our work for God. 
or failing to fulfill our human responsibility. We talked about this last week, you know, resting in God doesn't mean we abandon the work of the law, doesn't mean we leave our human responsibilities, we do all we have to do. And that's what the Bible says, after doing all, stand. That means you do your part and you leave the red for God. Or you do the possible and you leave impossibility for God. So rest in God, you want to make note on this. Resting in God means that we do everything that is possible. We do everything that is possible while it does the impossible. Glory to God. Can I repeat that? Resting in God because the time that we are in. I'm telling you, Sunday I will continue to teach this time. I haven't got there yet. I haven't got there yet. I've been teaching on, on, on uh, remember the TV question? When will this time be? What is the sign of your coming? And what is the sign of the end of age? Uh, uh, what I've been doing is to bring understanding. What does that mean? What does that mean? You will see when I begin this Sunday, I begin now to touch on the sign of the end time. You will know that it is upon us. We are experiencing, we are seeing the sign of the end time right now. We are seeing the sign of his appearing. Remember, I explained that Sunday, uh, 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 Jesus appearing and Jesus' second return. It's two different events. But what we are seeing now is the sign of Jesus appearing. He's going to, I believe, he's, he's going to appear very, very soon. I truly believe that. Because we will go over this Sunday, you will see all that is happening around us. Amen? So that's why this message is so important. Because when you see what is going on around us, you will be stressful. You will be distressed. But when you know how to apply, hallelujah, to apply the finished work on the cross, you can rest in God. Hallelujah. You rest in God after you have done the possible and you leave the impossible for God. Amen. We are not to do impossible. We are not called to do impossible. We are called to do possible. And he is special. <laughs> he specializing in, in, in doing the impossibility. Glory to God. And that's what the scripture said. After doing all. It means after you are doing, after you've done all possible. Leave impossible for God, because God specialized in impossibility. Glory to God. So in this time that we are in, we have to learn how to rest in God. If you don't learn, know how to rest in God, you will be depressed. You will be discouraged because it's happening. We are seeing all this sign of the end time. It's happening right here. Hallelujah. This is new. This, this is this part that we are going through right now. It is new. You cannot connect it to historical event. This is different. We haven't passed this way before. And that's why it's good to rest in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You rest in God. Amen. Let me give you this again. Resting in God. Resting in God means that we do everything that is possible we have to do everything that is possible why he god does the impossible after doing all stand not that don't do anything we have to do our part amen rest lead us to wait with expectation glory to god I love that, especially when I'm resting in God. I, I, I'm, I'm just expecting to see how God is going to move. How God is going to give me victory. How God is going to give us breakthrough. When you rest in God, that means you do all you have to do, and you rest in Him, and you have what? Expectation. Like, okay, now I have done all I need to do. Now I'm waiting to see how God is going to give me victory. So rest 
lead us to wait with expectation for God to act as triumph and triumph over our difficulties. Glory to God. That's why it's so good to rest in God. When you rest in God, you trust Him to give you victory. You trust Him to give you breakthrough. So, rest. Lead us to wait with expectation for God to act and triumph over our difficulties. So, it's very in the time that we are in. It's very important to learn how to rest in God. After doing all, after doing possible, you rest in God to do impossible. Amen. God don't expect you to do impossible. Those things that are impossible for man are possible with God. God but God wants you to do possible. Do all we have to do. Prayer worship, reading the scripture, do all that we need to do, what is possible, and our God will do impossible. When we rest in God, he gives us an, an unusual grace. When we rest in God, he gives us unusual grace and favor, open doors for us that were formerly closed, and guide us to receive what is deserve to give us. God has not called us to live in a state of stress. God has not called us to live in a state of stress. We talked about this before. Stress is an alert of fear or anxiety. Stress, when it comes, short-time stress is okay. Sometimes short-term stress actually could be positive because it's an alert that something is wrong or something bad is about to happen. So if you react quickly, it's positive. Positive. But what God, what we don't want to do is to prolong our stress because God has not called us to live in a state of stress. So we should not allow stress to control our life. Everything we need now and in the future was provided for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. Everything that you will ever need, everything that you need now, everything that you will need in the future has already been provided on the cross. 2,000 years ago, Jesus had provided everything for us. All we need to do, glory to God, is to apply it. Apply the finished work on the cross. Glory to God. Everything that you're going to need now, everything that you're going to need in the future, God has already done it for us. By faith, we, we, we can receive salvation. By faith, we receive our healing. By faith, we re receive our miracles. By faith, we receive transformation. By faith, we receive provision. By faith, we receive deliverance and much more. Jesus paid for everything completely. Listen to me saying, Jesus paid for everything completely. Everything that you will ever need now, that you need now, and that you will ever need in the future. That's why he came. Jesus didn't die on the cross in vain. He died on the cross to pay the price, oh Lord God of heaven, to pay the price for our healing, for our transformation, for our provision, for our deliverance, for our miracles, for our financial breakthrough has already been paid for. I believe it. You have to believe it. And you have to what? Apply the finished work on the cross. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus has already paid the price for it. It's just that the enemy is cunning 
He wants us not to believe. He wants us not to believe that Christ has already paid the price for it. The enemy like for us to be in the state of stress. In the state of stress. Jesus has paid the price for everything that you will need today, tomorrow, and forever. He has paid the price for it 20 years ago. So today, begin to increase your faith. Uh -uh, that's what the pillar of faith does. They are the pillar that sustain our faith. Pillars that increase our faith. So we can obtain what God has promised us. So today, begin to increase your faith by speaking to your circumstances. Speak to your circumstances. Speak to your mountain. Speak to your financial problems. Speak to your marital conflict. Speak to your sickness. Speak to your depression. Speak to your children's rebellion. Speak to your torment. Speak to fear. Speak to disease. Hallelujah. You got to speak to that mountain that wants to stop you from entering rest in God. Amen. Because Jesus has paid the price for this. Say this after me. Jesus, if you speak to it, you say, Jesus paid for this on the cross. Whatever the problem is, that you're going through right now, that don't want you to enter rest, that don't want to receive your miracles or receive your healings or receive your deliverance, you speak to it right now. You say it this way, Jesus paid for this on the cross. You mountain, I command you to move in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus paid Paid for this on the cross right now and rest in his finished work and God promises. I am going, I am not going to become stressful. Speak to the mountain. I am not going to become stressful. Jesus has already given me the victory. Speak it. Hallelujah. Jesus has already given me the victory. He has paid for the death, my death on, uh, of sin. I hold that I hold. And he has completely defeated the enemy. Hallelujah. Speak to your circumstances and apply the finished work on the cross. Speak to that back pain. Speak to that migraine headache. Speak to that mountain. Speak to that stress. Speak to that disease. Speak to spirit of evidence. Speak to spirit of discouragement. And say, Jesus, pay for this on the cross right now. I rest in the finished work of the cross. Hallelujah. To the Lamb of God. It's about time we need to begin to apply the finished work of Jesus Christ. He has given you the victory. Rise up and rejoice. Rise up and praise God. He has given you the victory. He has paid for it. You don't need to pay anymore. Glory to God in highest. Jesus has already given me the victory. You have the victory. Apply the finished work of the cross. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say Once again, say, Jesus, speak to the mountain. As a mountain, I command you to go. Because Jesus paid for this on the cross. Right now, I rest in his finished work. And God promises. I am not going to become stressful. Come on, say to it. I am not going to become stressful. Come on, say to it with boldness, with authority. I am not going to become stressful. Jesus has already given me the victory. Jesus has already given me the victory. He has paid for the death of sin. I hold. And he has completely defeated the enemy. Glory to God. Glory to God. So these will conclude the first pillars 
of faith. The first pillar that sustains our faith is applying the finished work on the cross. I'm telling you, you apply this, your problem will fly away. Your problem will go. Hallelujah. Sickness will go. Because Jesus has already paid the price for it. Amen. Yes, I can do it for you, but it's better to do it for yourself. It's better for you to learn how to apply the finished work of the cross. That's how your faith increases. It is a pillar, glory to God, that increases our faith. Glory to God. Now, number two. Let's go to number two. The second pillar that sustains our faith is to rest in God's presence. Resting in God's presence. Amen. We talked before how to eliminate burden by entering into the presence of God. That's how we elim eliminate our burdens. We enter into the presence of God. We must learn not only to enter, we must learn to remain in His presence. We must learn to remain in his presence. The pure, unpolluted atmosphere that our Heavenly Father designed. Amen. Our Heavenly Father designed his presence for us. For us to remain. Amen. You see in Genesis, Adam and Eve, they are always in the atmosphere of God's presence. Is in God's presence. Mankind did not fall. You will see Adam and Eve did not fall from a place. They fell from God's presence. Amen? But let us get, get this. Mankind did not fall from a place. When they sinned, they didn't fall from a place. It, they fell from God's presence from the environment of glory. Because when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden is an environment of glory. Where God's present is. That's why when they were in that garden, it was impossible for them to be sick. They cannot get sick. No sickness, no diseases, no infirmity. There was no pain. In God's glory. God actually, his intention is for us to remain in his presence. Hallelujah. When you remain in his presence, burden is gone. So you will see in the garden, they didn't fall from a place. They fell from his glory. From the environment of glory. That's what God created for us. And that's why we are not designed to carry stress, a pr prolonged stress. Because when you carry prolonged stress, stress begins to define you. Are you hearing me? So Eden, the Garden of Eden was designed as a place of ongoing. As a place of ongoing spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical rest. You will see when they were in the garden... Everything was peaceful. When they were in the garden, in the glory realm, they were not supposed to die. There's no death in the glory realm. There's no pain in the glory realm. And that's why we have to learn how to enter into his presence and to remain into his presence. Glory to God. Glory to God. Even though Adam and Eve walk and tending garden, but the experience no interpersonal conflict, no toy, no stress until they rebel against God. It was until they rebel against God, they sin against God, they fell out from His presence. Not from one place to another, but they fell out from the presence of the Lord. When they disobey Him, when they disobeyed him, they were removed from his presence. And humanity was not restored 
to that present in the complete sense until Christ came to earth and reconciled us back to the Father. And that's one of the reasons Jesus came. He came to reconcile us back to the Father. Glory to God. So not only we learn how to enter his presence, we have to learn also how to remain in his presence. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. Even the Bible tells us that after Jesus' death, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. I'm going to go over that real quick. Uh, 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 let's go to Matthew 27, 51. Matthew 27, 51. So Jesus came to restore us back to the Father. That's why the veil of the temple, because there was partition. There was partition uh, uh, to enter the holy of holiest. When Jesus died, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the Bible makes us understand that the veil ran in the temple from top to bottom, not bottom to top. Top to bottom signify the act of God, not the act of man. If he was torn from the bottom to top, that may signify man. But from top to bottom, it is the heart of God. God did it because the veil is run and we can now enter into his presence. Not only enter, but also learn how to remain in his presence. Now you will see that in Matthew 27, 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. The veil of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. Also, we will see and Luke 23 45. Luke 23 45. Then the sun was darkened. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. Was torn in two. Symbolizing that Jesus has opened full access to the Father. Hello, somebody. That symbolizes that Jesus had opened up full access. We have full access to the Father. From the time that Jesus restored us, Believer have the have been able to enter confidently into God's presence. Amen. Jesus, that death on the cross, opened the veil, turned the veil, so we can enter into the presence of the Lord. Of the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Say, come unto me. You see that? Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, What? Come to me. This is I will come to you, but come to me. In other words, come into my presence. Glory to God. Come into my presence and come and offload your body. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because when you enter into his presence, glory to God. You're trading your body for his body. Hallelujah. You're trading your yoke for his yoke. He said, my yoke is light. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. Come to me, all you who labor and are every lady. When we are in the presence of the Lord, nothing that might happen around us or in the world can cause us to enter into a cycle of worry or fear because we know that God is in control. God is in control. What am I saying? When you enter, when you enter into his presence, let me tell you, you are no longer in control. Father, we thank you. And that, that's one of the reasons why we don't receive miracle. When you are in control, there's no miracle. But when you come into his presence, 
Glory to God. When you enter into his presence, you are no longer in control. He is in control. Glory to God. And when he's in control, there's no fear. There's no worries. Glory to God. Because God is in control. There's no pain. God is in control. When you enter into his presence. And that's why the scripture emphasized. Let's go to Hebrews 4.10. Hallelujah. When you enter into his presence, he is in control. But when you are out of his presence, you are in control. That's why we struggle. That's why we are stressful. That's why we are going through. That's why we are worried. That's why we are afraid. Because we didn't come into his presence. He said, come unto me. Come, bring your body, bring your yoke to me. When you get into his presence, he is in control of your life. He is in control of your family. He is in control of your marriage. He is in control of your job. He is in control of, of your businesses. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, let's go to Hebrews 4.10. He is in control. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And that's why I told somebody on the presidential election, I told him, it doesn't matter who becomes the president. God is in control of my life. It doesn't matter. Who run with the president? It doesn't matter. Independent? Republican? Them, it does not matter. God is in control. Hallelujah. And that's why when you rest in God, oh, God is in control. It doesn't matter what decision they are doing. It doesn't matter what they are doing. God is in control. Glory to God. Let's go to Hebrews 4.10. It's a lot I want to cover today. Hebrews 4.10. Glory to God. For he, for he who was, who, for he, for he who has entered his rest as himself also sees from his work as God did from east. Are you with me, church? For he who has entered his rest as himself also sees from his work as God did for himself. So if you enter his rest, no more work. Work ceased. Hallelujah. Work ceased as his work as God did from his. As God rests from his work, when you enter his rest, you too, you will rest. So God is in control. Amen. You rest in God and God work for you. When you rest in God, you, 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 you depend on God, you trust God to do impossible. We do possible. Why God do impossible? But if you don't rest in God, you, you can only do possible, nobody to do impossible. But when you rest in God, after you have done possible and you rest in God, God will do impossible. If you have some issues that are impossible to man, what you need to do, stop struggling. Stop trying to do it by yourself. All you need to do is to rest in him. After you have done possible, God will do impossible. All you do, you rest in him and you trust him and you are expectant to see how God is going to give you that breakthrough. Amen. Now let's also go to Exodus. Exodus 33 14. Exodus 33 14. Yes. God is in control. If you want God to be in control of your life, you must learn how to enter His presence. You must learn how to enter His presence and remain in, in, in His presence. Then God will do impossible things. For you. Let's go to Exodus 33 14. Exodus 33 14. 
God said, my presence will go with you. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In the presence of God, what we have pre previously struggled to accomplish can happen easily in a short time due to the working of his supernatural. That's what God told Moses. He told Moses, my presence will go with you. When well, you remember there was a conversation going on between God and Moses. Moses said after the chain of Israel of sin, he said, God, I am not going unless you go with us. If you don't go with us, I am not going. Because Moses knew if he doesn't enter, God does not go with them, they are not going to be successful. Their enemy is going to defeat them. Because he knows that when you are in the presence of God, God fights for you. When you are in the presence of God, the battle belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. To the Lamb of God. So he told God, God, if you don't go with us, I am not going. And God promised his presence. He promised his divine presence. He said, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. When the presence of God is going with you, God give you rest. That means you are not working. God is working on your behalf. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Oh, I pray right now that God, somebody will get a hold and learn how to rest in God. Will learn how to be in the presence of God. Hallelujah. That's the number two, uh, the second pillar of faith. To know when you are in the presence of God, God give you rest. That means you rest while God does the work. You rest, God does the work for you. You rest in God and you trust God to do impossibility. Remember, resting in God doesn't mean we abandon what we have to do. We have to work. We have to do possible. Possible is for man. Impossible is for God. You do impossible and you rest in God. In his presence, he gives you rest. You rest while he does the work. Come on, somebody, bless the name of Jesus. That's what I told Moses, my presence will go with you. Anywhere I'm going, I pray. Say, God, should I go? Because I, I understand this. If God didn't tell me to go, I go on my own. I am on my own. If God goes with me, he gives me rest. He does the work. He gives me direction. Give me information. Tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. Tell me when to do it. Tell me how to do it. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? He gives me rest. Let's struggle. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He said, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. So let me say this again. In the presence of God, in the presence of God, what we have, have previously struggled to accomplish can happen easily and in a short time due to the working of his supernatural power. True is supernatural power. I have frequently witnessed the truth, this truth. First hand, there have been times when I become worried and stressed due to the many burdens and responsibility. Both, you know, local, both global responsibility, international responsibility, home responsibility, family responsibility, but when I enter into God's presence, everything changes. Listen to me. When I enter into God's presence, everything changes. There's a lot of responsibility. Family responsibility. Church responsibility. International, business, uh, international ministry responsibility. 
a business responsibility, local business responsibility, international business responsibility. It's just so much responsibility. But what I do, I enter into his presence. This never fails. Anytime I enter into his presence, I'm telling you, everything changes. I want to challenge you to do this. And we're going to talk. How do you enter his, uh, his presence? I'm going to talk about that. I'm taking this step by step. Just bear with me. Step by step. Because I can hear the spirit. Someone say, okay, how do I enter? Man of God, you've been telling me, enter, 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 enter his presence. How do I enter in his presence? I will get there very soon. It's next, actually. It's next. So, with all these burdens and responsibility, I have to do this, I have to do that, you know. But, but anytime I enter into his presence, everything changes. I'm telling you, even yesterday I was here, I was supposed to go into prayer. Right before I went into prayer, boom, there's a worship song came into my spirit. The Lord is my witness. I didn't even get into prayer. I enter in his presence in a split second. I enter his presence split second. Boom! I was right there. How do I know that? I had peace. I sang this song. I'm telling you, close to three hours. One song. Close to three hours. I just go on. I just, it's like I can't stop. I was enjoying this song. I was lifting up my hand, enjoying this song. You know, I know God. I do I know I was in his presence. I knew I was in the present because I was not even aware of time. I was not aware of time when I checked my clock. It was almost 2 a.m. in the morning here. 2 a.m. in the morning. You know, I was in his present. Split second. I didn't even pray. I was supposed to pray and go into worship. Boom. The song just came into my spirit. It's a worship song. I just sang the song. I sang the song. I was in that present. I didn't recognize, I was not aware of time. In the presence of God, there's no time. In the glory realm, there's no time. I was not aware of time. I just sang that one song until I went to sleep. Jehovah is my witness. One, I was right there. I was right there in his presence. And all the things I plan to do and this and that and that. It was just peace. Glory to God. Everything changes. When you enter into his presence. With all this responsibility. Do this and do that and do this. I don't begin to worship. And the, spirit, the, came, the song came from the belly of God. Not me. Because my intention is to pray and then go into worship. And they get to prayer. Just this one song over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Later, after I finish, after I left the present, I said, Wow, it's two o'clock in the morning. One song. Yes. It's very important. When you enter it, everything changes. How do you enter? Now, let's talk about how you enter into his presence. He's praying and worship. You pray, you're going to worship. And communion with God. Every time I do that. But yesterday was just different. You know, we start with prayer, giving thanks to God. Prayer, prayer, flow into worship. Yesterday, I didn't even pray. I came and sang the same place. This same place I was sitting here to go into prayer and to worship. The song came, that was it. I was in a split second. I was right there. So how do you enter into the presence of God? You start with prayer. Go into worship. Prayer and worship. Or you can start with prayer, praise, Worship. Prayer. Praise. Worship. Because praise prepares us to enter into worship. We don't rush 
into worship. We enter into worship. As you pray, from prayer, you can go straight into worship. If, if, you have, if you're somebody that does this all the time, if you do it all the time, in few minutes, you'll be there. I'm telling you, Jehovah is my witness. Seconds, I was there. I didn't even, I, I didn't even pray. The song just came into my spirit. One song for almost three hours. It's like I can't stop. I just continue. I just continue. I just continue. Then I knew God was doing something based on the song, the worship that God gave to me. Amen. So how do we enter his presence? You can start with prayer. You gradually start with prayer. Go into praise. Go into worship. But if someone that has prayer life, it shouldn't take you long. We have prayer life, boom. You can get in there or start with praise. Then you flow into worship. Amen. So you will feel rest. So when you pray, prayer, worship, and communion with God, you will feel what? Rest. Everything will change. Now, you can't rush. You can't do this if you're about to go to work. You can't do this if you have an appointment coming. You have to do this when you have the time. Maybe in the evening when you don't have to go to work, you do it and you go to bed. In the morning, if you have to go to work, sometimes when you get in that present, you won't be able to come out, rush out. No. <laughs> You won't be able to. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you will feel rest. After praying, worship, and communion with God, you will feel rested. Why does this happen? Now I'm going to be answering the question. This will help uh, 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 some of us. Why does this happen? After you pray, after you worship, and you feel rested. Why did this happen? First, because daily in His presence, you will recognize a new that God is your father. As you do it, you, it's like every day you recognize it. God is my father. He is mighty God and he is my father and I am his son. And he loved me. Glory to God. Perfect love cast out all fear. He cast it out. So when you do that, you pray, maybe praise, but enter into worship, and you feel rested because daily in his presence, when I do it, I recognize a new that God is my father, and I am his son. It's like it's an assurance. God say, I am your father. And I am, he is my, I am a son. I am a son of God, not a friend of God. If he's my father, and I am a son, he won't allow anything bad to happen to me. If he's my father, and I am a son, he won't allow the devil to torment me. If I'm a son of God, why would a father allow an enemy to destroy his own son? So when I see the two relationship, my position in God. You see, when you enter, you see your position in God. But if you don't enter his presence, there's so much noise of the enemy. The devil is talking, blah, 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 blah. But when you enter his presence, all the noises are gone. Noises, the enemy noise cannot manifest in the presence of God because it's not allowed in the presence of God. And that's why he will fight you to enter his presence. Oh, my mind. My man, Kota Keke Toro Soko Basaya, he will fight you to enter. He don't want you to enter. He will block you to enter the presence of God. Because he, when you enter, he cannot enter with you. So when you do this, you pray, 
and you go into worship. You feel rested. Because you see in his presence, you recognize again in you that God is your father. And I am his son. And he loves me. He loves me. With this assurance, I will slip, simply, with this assurance, I will simply give all my burdens to him. He is my father. I am a son. No, I'm not a stepson. I'm not a friend. I am his son. You are his daughter. You are his son. He is your father. Hallelujah. To the Lamb of God. And he loves you. It's an assurance. With that assurance, you can give him your burden. You can give him your problems. You can give him your situation. Give him. Let him take it. He's my father. He will take care of me. He will protect me. He will provide for me. That's how it happens. And you feel every time I enter his presence, everything changes. And yesterday, I mean, I was supposed to come and pray or something. I didn't even get to pray for this. I just begin to worship. I just begin to worship. And I just feel a new that God got this. God got my problems. Glory to God. I didn't even get the chance to give it to him. He just took it. He just took it. Oh, Father, we thank you. Oh, Father, we thank you. Now, so when you feel that, that God is your father, I am his son, and he loves me. With these assurances, he simply give him all my burdens. They are no longer under my control. That's what happens when you enter his presence. They are no longer, you give it to him. They are no longer under my control. I leave them in his hands. I leave situation in his hands. I leave difficulties in his hands. I leave impossibility in his hands. I leave all this responsibility in his hands. After I am doing all, I enter his presence. He is my father. I am a son. He loved me with this assurance. I hand over my body. I hand over my yoke. I hand over everything to him. They are no longer in my control. I leave them in his hands. And that's why I agree with this author. Let's go to Hebrews 4.11. I agree with this the, the Hebrews author. I, I, Hebrews 4.11. I want us to go there quick together. I leave everything for him. He is my father. I am a son. He will take care of me. No, I am not his friend. I am a son. Glory to God. He will take care of me. I leave it for him. All my problem is in, in his hands. He will take care of them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He, Hebrews 4.11. That's why I agree with this author of Hebrews. Who encourage us. He said, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Be diligent. Work hard. Don't let the enemy stop you. Let us therefore be diligent. Hallelujah. I know many people now, the enemy is stopping you. don't want you to enter that rest. You don't want you to enter in the presence of God because he cannot enter. He wants to stop you. He cannot enter. He's not allowed in the presence of God. So what he does, he wants to stop you. So he can continue to torment you. Is not allowed. No, he cannot enter. And that's why many of us are struggling to enter into the presence of God. We are struggling. You know, it's a spiritual struggle because the enemy doesn't want you to enter. He cannot enter. And he will try to stop you from entering into his presence. Don't allow it. And that's why I agree. With, 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 with the scripture, Hebrews 4, 11. Let us therefore be diligent. Be diligent to enter the rest. Lest 
anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Oh my God. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, to enter into his presence. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Enter the rest. Be diligent. It will not be easy. That's what the, the Bible, the author used the word diligent. Diligent to enter. Don't let nothing stop you to enter into, into his presence. The scripture also says, in his presence, there are fullness of joy. There's no pain in his presence. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into the rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Now, please note this. One of the reasons the devil tried to prevent us from entering into prayer and communion with God is that let me do this slowly. Whoa, we got to get this. Be diligent. Don't allow the enemy to stop you to enter rest, to enter into his presence. Listen to this. One of the reasons the devil tries to prevent us from entering into prayer and communion with God is that in the presence of the Lord there is no spiritual warfare one of the reasons the devil tries to prevent all from entering into prayer and communion with God is that in his presence in the presence of the Lord there is no warfare why there's no warfare why because the enemy does not have access in the presence he don't want you to enter because the moment you enter the presence of God no more warfare it stopped why because the enemy does not have access to God's presence he cannot attack us there. Oh God of heaven. He cannot attack you in the presence of God. In the presence of God, there is no warfare. No. No warfare in the presence of God. Because the enemy does not have access into the presence of God. The enemy is not allowed in the presence of God. Does not have access. No warfare. And that's why he don't want you to enter that rest. He don't want you to enter to the presence of God. The presence of God is a great pillar of our faith. It's a great pillar of our faith of overcoming stress. Of over taking away your body. In the presence of God, there are fullness of joy. There's no pain in the presence of God. There's no battle in the presence of God. There's no warfare in the presence of God. There no warfare. No warfare because the enemy does not have access to God's presence. He cannot attack us there. He tried to distract us and wear us out. Wear us down so that, like him, we will not be able to drink from our source of life. That's why that's where we drink the source of life in his presence. He will stop you to enter because he does not have access to enter into God's presence. When we are moved from our source. We end up dry and burned out. Let us always remember the answer to such a condition. The answer to such a condition is to enter the presence of God. 
Let's go to Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19. Wow, the time, time is flying. Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sin may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Time of refreshing. The Lord is the source of life, is the source of our life, is the one that refresh us. So times of refreshing come from the Lord. It comes from the presence of the Lord. So if you want to be refreshed, time of refreshing, you have to enter. You have to enter his presence. And that's why the enemy don't want us to enter his presence so that we will not drink from the source of life. He doesn't want us to drink from the source of life. Amen. That's why he want us, want, what, he doesn't want us to enter into his presence. Also in his presence, there is no warfare. So the enemy will do all he could to stop you from entering into his presence. That's the second pillar of faith. Second pillar to sustain, to sustain our faith. So we can overcome stress, problem, or any situation. So repentance, now we also have to get this. Repentance is not something we do only once. At the beginning of our life in Christ. On the contrary, we must repent daily of disobedience and lack of faith. We must repent daily. Disobedience to God. We must repent also for lack of faith. Because lack of faith is sin. We must repent daily. Because without true repentance, we cannot access the time of refreshing. Without true repentance, we cannot access the time of refreshing. Amen? Question, how long should it take for us to enter God's presence? I know somebody might be asking that too. How long is it going to take me to enter God's presence? If, if you are a prayer person, you have prayer life and you always worship it's, it should not take you much time few minutes few minutes you can enter that presence if you are a person that always pray that have prayer life and worship if you are a worshiper it should not take you long now yesterday happened to me split second worship I was right there I was right there. I literally split second. So if you're someone that have prayer life and you worship, if you are a worshiper, it won't take you long at all to enter his presence. Excuse me. One second. My back is down here. About that my battery is dying here. All right, it should be charging now. Sorry. Now, so if you, a person that have prayer life, that pray all the time, it won't take you long. Especially if you are a worshiper. I truly really believe every believer should be a worshiper. The Bible tells us in John 4, 23, 24, God is looking for those that will worship him. God is looking for worshiper. I'm talking about true worshiper that will worship him in spirit and in truth. I truly believe every believer, every believer should be a worshiper. If you are a worshiper, it won't take you long at all. I'm talking about minutes. 
I'm talking about minutes, you should be there even second. If you are a worshiper, you worship God all the time, or you are a prayer warrior, it will not take you long. Hallelujah. I sat right here yesterday to pray. Boom. A song came into my spirit. I truly believe God wants me to, 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 to worship Him. I just worship. I, I mean, I was going, going one song for hours, for hours, hours, worship and worship and worship and worship. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? So you, it shouldn't take you so long. I mean, it take me a second. Yesterday I was right there with worship. Amen. Now, we are not created to enter his presence and then leave it. We are not created. We are not created to enter his presence and leave it, but to remain in it. Therefore, staying in the presence should be our goal. Staying in the presence of God should be our goal. Each time we seek God, we should be able to enter his presence faster and find it easy to do each time. It should get faster. Each time. Boom. We should enter his presence quick. Amen. Especially if you have prayer life, you are a worshiper. I truly believe every believer should be a worshiper. In no three seconds, you will be there. Amen. So if you are facing a situation that causes you stress, you urgently need to enter his presence. You urgently need to enter his presence. If you are facing a situation that is causing you stress, you need to enter his presence. He will remove every burden, give you rest, and work a miracle. Because in his presence, there is total provision. In his presence, there is total provision. So he will remove everybody, give you rest, and work a miracle. If you enter his presence, because in his presence, there is total provision. Glory to God. I know some people, they, they, they say, well, to enter his presence, but enter his presence is too long. Oh, it takes more time to enter his presence. No, it don't take long time. The only people that will take long time for is those people that don't have prayer life, those that are not worshiper. If you are a worshiper of God, it will take you minutes, few minutes, you should be there. You start with prayer or start with praise, Go to worship. Go to worship. As I said yesterday, I didn't even pray. I didn't even praise. I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do yesterday. A song came into my spirit. I sang that for almost three hours. I was right there. Split second. Amen. Amen. Well, we're gonna enter. Now, another question. That is always asked. Probably somebody is asking that right now in their spirit. How can we know that we are in the presence of God? I can send somebody who want to know an answer for that. How can we know that we are in the presence of God? Like yesterday, the moment I begin to worship, the first thing I have was peace. Peace. The first thing you find there is peace. When you enter the presence of God, you feel peace. Regardless of what you are going through before you enter. Peace. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what happened. When you enter in His presence, the first thing is peace. We also feel a reverent fear. That's number two. Reverent fear. When I say reverent fear, reverential fear of God. 
not to be afraid of God, but reverential fear of God. So number one thing you feel is peace when you enter into his presence. And remember, peace and rest is deterrent to stress. Peace or rest is deterrent to stress. So when you enter God's presence, you feel peace. Two, you feel a reverent fear, reverential fear of God. Next, you have a sense of security and protection. Glory to God. Glory to God. So number one is peace, when you enter in his presence. Second is reverential fear of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Referential fear. The second, the third, is you have security and protection. Because in his presence, his presence becomes a shield around us. Additionally, we are surrounded by his eternal, unconditional, supernatural love. You feel the love of God. Unconditional, supernatural love of God. You feel it as well in his presence. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So it's very important we learn how to enter into his presence and remain in his presence. So that's the second pillar that sustains our faith. The first pillar that sustains our faith is applying the finished work of the cross. Applying the finished work on the cross. Number two is the presence of God. The presence of God. Now I'm going to go to number three. Do I have time to do that? I've been on for two hours. Let's do this quick. Number three. I have to finish this today. Number three. Receiving the supernatural grace of God. Remember we are talking about the three pillars that sustain our faith. One, applying the finished work on the cross. Two, the presence of God. Three, receiving supernatural grace of God. So the third pillar that sustains our faith is to receive God's supernatural grace. Grace referred to being granted favor. Grace refers to being granted a favor, talent, or gift from God that we do not desire. It is included the bestower of a supernatural power, which enables us to be and do what we cannot do, achieve in our own capacity. In our own capacity. Let me repeat the definition of grace. Grace refers to being granted a favor, talent, or gift from God that we cannot, that we do not desire. It includes the bestower of a supernatural power which enables us to be and do what we cannot achieve on our own. In other words, grace is the ability God gives us to work in the supernatural. Grace is the ability God gives us to work in the supernatural. It is important to understand what God's grace really is because various doctrines, I'm just going to do this quick, various doctrines have had teaching 
on grace. People use grace to live in sin. Even upon preacher preaching grace, as if, yes, Jesus has done everything. We have nothing to do just to chill and just enjoy it. That is incorrect. I've heard many people doctrine teach grace uh, today. I, I mean, it's heresy. I consider it an, as an heresy. They preach that claim that the Christian don't have no more responsibility because Jesus has done everything. We have no more responsibility because Jesus did everything for us on the cross. This is a half truth. It's half truth. Yet Jesus did finish work on the cross. I just talked about it. It is true, but it's half truth. But it's also true that we also have actively participate in God's purpose. We have to actively participate in God's purposes. The way they teach grace nowadays is as if as Christians, we don't have to do anything. Jesus has done everything. All we have to do is to chill and just let God do everything for us. Remember, I also talked about resting in God means that we do possible. Why God do impossible? Amen? So we also, I mean, the way they preach great grace, I've had it on TV, so-called big minister preach grace as if Christian, we don't have no more responsibility. Jesus did everything for us. It is half true, not 100% true. There's a finished work of the cross. There is a finished work on the cross. Jesus has done all of that for us. But as Christian, we have the truth. We have actively, we act, we, we are to actively participate in God's purposes. Amen. We have to actively participate in God's purposes. We also have work to do. Grace is not not doing nothing. We have to be active. The Bible says, work on your salvation. <laughs> it's a progressive sanctification. So I've heard many teaching of grace. Really, it is ungodly. It is not true. A amen? Yes, that Jesus has done everything. That's our truth. But as Christians, our work is not finished. Come on, somebody. Our work is not finished. We have responsibility. We have, we are to actively participate in God's purposes. We have to obey God. Amen. Let me show you scripture. Let's go to Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good work. We have work to do. We are created for good work. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should work in them. We have responsibility. Grace doesn't mean. We don't have to do anything anymore. I've had people preaching. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Do whatever you want to do. The grace of God will cover you. No. Shall we con continue in sin. That the grace of God might abound. Certainly no, we cannot. We have responsibility as Christian. Glory to God. I will tell you, I'm going to do this real quick because time. I will tell you what God's grace enable us to do. We have what to do. Amen. We have to participate in God's purposes for our lives. We have an assignment. We have a calling. Glory to God. We have a calling to fulfill. We have work to do in the kingdom of God. No, we have to be active in God's purpose for our lives, especially in the end time that we are in. You will see Sunday, we're going to be talking about some things. Yes, we got, you see? Anyway, I, I, will, I will teach that on Sunday. <laughs> so we got to be careful. Let me just round up. Oh, can't finish this. Let's let just finish here. What grace? Now we talk about purpose. We have to be actively 
active, we have purposes, we have responsibility as Christian. According to the scripture, God has released his grace in Christ Jesus to accomplish all these purposes. We have work to do, we have responsibility. Grace doesn't mean we don't do anything. Amen. Glory to God. What are the purposes? To accomplish, to save us. It, to save us, for by grace you have been saved. We are saved by grace, through faith, and are not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Also, some of the purposes, to conquer the enemy. To conquer the enemy. We have responsibility. We are called to utterly destroy the works of the enemy. We have works to do. Amen. Grace doesn't mean doing nothing. But grace actually means the ability to do great works. The ability to do great purpose for God. To do great work for God. That's why he give us grace to do. Hallelujah. Not grace not to do. Grace to do. I've had many teaching on grace. I'm like, wow. No. No. That's heresy. No. That's false doctrine. God give us grace to give us the ability to do more. To do more work. Glory to God. So grace is to save us. I know that next. Grace to conquer the enemy. We are called to conquer all the works of the enemy. We are called to utterly destroy the works of the enemy. That's why Jesus came. And Jesus has given us that responsibility. Amen. And how we can do it is only by the grace of God. Because the grace of God enables us. He gives us supernatural power to destroy, to conquer all the territory of the enemy. And to deliver God's people and bring them into the kingdom of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Grace is to be saved. Grace to conquer the work of the enemy. We have responsibility. We have a lot of responsibilities, God's people. Grace is not to chill and not to do and to live in sin. No, no, no. No. Grace is the ability that God gives us to do His purpose. Hallelujah. We are called to utterly destroy every works of the enemy. You need that grace. You need that supernatural power. And it came from, from grace. God give it to you because of grace. So grace to conquer the enemy. Glory to God. Let's go to Romans 16, 20. Romans 16, 20. You will see there. And the God of peace will cross Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Next one. Grace is to empower us to overcome sin in our lives. No grace allow us to sin. Amen? I've heard people preach grace like that. Yeah, grace of God will abound. Just do whatever you want to do. Grace of God will cover you. No. Grace of God empower us to overcome sin. Not to sin. Grace of God empower us to overcome sin in our lives. Consider Romans 6.14. Romans 6 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Oh, glory to God. Grace is not to sin. I said, Grace of God is to empower us, to give us that supernatural power to say no to sin. Mm, glory to God. Yes. To empower us to overcome sin in our life. To increase our willpower and to say no to sin. Grace does not give us permission to sin. But grace empowers us to say no to sin. To overcome sin 
in our life. That is great. He gave us the supernatural power, supernatural ability to say, no, I won't do this. Glory to God. Also, grace enables us to live in holiness. Oh, God of heaven, we thank you. Grace enables us to live in holiness. He enables us. He gives us the ability. He gives us supernatural ability to live in holiness. You see Acts 20, 32. This is grace. Not to sin. But he enables us to live in holiness. In the age that we are in, in the time that we are in, we need the grace of God to be able to live in holiness. Because in the end time, lawlessness will abound. Lawlessness will abound. But listen to me, grace will be greater than lawlessness. So we might be able to live in holiness and righteousness. Glory to God. Glory to God. We thank you. Quick, let's go to Act 20, 32. I'm almost finished. Let me do this quick. I don't want to come back here next week. Get to move to something. Part 7 or something different. Amen. Acts 20, 32. He said, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That is grace. That is grace to enable us to live in holiness. He said, now, I, I, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. In other words, his supernatural grace, which is able. Grace is to build you up. And give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Grace enable us to live in holiness. Enable us to live in righteousness. Hallelujah. Enable all to be sanctified. And be among those that are sanctified. From the world but unto God. Amen. Let's go quick. Next one. Grace is to empower us to live in true righteousness. Grace is to empower us to live in true righteousness. Let's go to Galatia and I will quick. I will give you one more, then I will stop. I can finish. We will do this another time or so. As God leads. There's more, 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 but time will not permit. Let's go to Galatians 2.21. Galatians 2.21, after this, then another one, we will stop there. Galatians 2.21, I just need to talk just a little bit about grace. I've had a lot of teaching now. That's, mm, teach grace as if it's okay to sin and do whatever you want to do. No, we have responsibility. Grace is an ability that God gave us. Amen? Now, Galatians 2.21. Grace is to empower us to live in true righteousness. You will see, it says, Galatians 2.21, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness come through the law, then Christ died in vain. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness come through the law, then now. We know now that grace is to empower us to live in true righteousness. The next one, and I will stop here. Grace also enables us to fulfill our purpose and calling. And as I said, we have responsibility. Grace is the ability that God gives us. Glory to God. To actually overcome stress as well, since we're teaching stress. But grace is not permission to sin. But to, you know, amen? But grace is the ability. Also, you will see here, grace enable us to fulfill our purpose and calling we have responsibility glory to god and for us to fulfill that responsibility the purpose that we have for god we need the grace of god we need the ability to do all of this you will see let's go quick and i will stop here there's so much i still need to teach but may, most likely maybe next time i'll go to something else
glory to God. Uh, I've been here now almost six weeks, right? Wow. Six weeks, next week will be seven weeks. Mm. We say 2 Timothy 1 9. 2 Timothy 1 9. 2 Timothy 1 9. Grace to enable us to fulfill our purpose and calling. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So I'm going to stop here. Three pillars that sustain our faith. Number one, applying the finished work of the cross. Number two, the presence of God. Number three, grace. I didn't quite finish grace, but I will see how God then. I, what I need to do next is to connect it with rest. To connect it with rest. Or, or how to overcome stress. I didn't get there today, God's willing. We can do it next week or continue. Amen. Are you blessed today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We thank you, God. We thank you, Father. Remember the three pillars. This pillar are powerful. We'll elevate your faith. Glory to God. We we'll empower you. Number one pillar, we have to always apply the finish work on the cross. Jesus completely paid for it. Glory to God. So that's what we call the sustainer of faith. Applying the finished work on the cross. Number two is the presence of God. Very powerful. Learn how to enter his presence and know how also to remain in his presence. Number three is the grace of God. Receiving the grace of God. The grace of God gives us the ability to overcome stress. Hallelujah. The grace of God gives us the supernatural ability for our calling. Glory to God. That's what grace is. Amen. Give us talent, ability to do what we are called to do. As Christians, we have responsibility. Amen. Yes, Jesus has finished everything for us on the cross, but we have role, we have power, we have purpose. Amen. Also, we have to apply it. We have to believe. Amen. What he has done on the cross and have confidence and apply it to the area of our life. Or I can use the word execute. Execute what he has done. Execute the verdict. The verdict was done on the cross. It is finished. Then we have to execute it. Without execution, verdict is in vain. And that's why a lot of people are not receiving their breakthrough. Jesus has done it. The thing is automatic. You got to execute. It has to be executed. Glory to God. Verdict without execution is in vain. And that's why people are not receiving their healing, receiving their breakthrough, because oh, Jesus has done it. You have to execute. You have to apply it. Amen. Glory to God. God bless you.